You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means it is not Education Wednesday. It's Education Tuesday. Coming at you a little bit early this week for yet another double dose of options boot camp. Because we love you folks. If you want to catch it live in your ear holes, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. That's the place that you go to get access to the live streams, all the other fun we have cooking over there on the pro side, including great pro Q&A sessions, options oddities, as well as, of course, great giveaways. And I will be doing a very fun panel tomorrow at the Securities Traders Association of Chicago event. Going to have our buddy, the flow master, Henry Schwartz from SIBO, JJ from formerly from TD, now from uh, Tasty and CEO of IG. Got Greg, who does a lot of the crypto vol for us on the crypto rundown. Going to all talk about all the hot stuff in the world of options, including maybe a little bit of zero day fun. Uh, so if you want to hear that panel, we're going to try to get it up for you folks over there on the pro side as well. So all sorts of bonuses go up there as well, as well as, of course, great giveaways. So head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. That'll also give you access to all these fun double headers that we do pretty much seems like all the time here in the world of options boot camp. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which so many of you our binging, our main line in these days, and if you can't make the pro for whatever reason, but you do like what you hear, throw a rating, a star, a comment, all of that does help new people discover the show, and you can do it in a bunch of different places, including uh, this week we have uh, coming in from Twitter, it's one of our regular listeners, uh, Theta Noob, I think he has written in in the past, saying, just wanted to thank Mark and Dan for dedicating your time to teach the masses an invaluable skill. If you're starting out, go through the archives of Options Bootcamp. If you're still here trading, don't stop learning and listening. Well, thank you very much, Theta New, but everyone else who takes the time out to post inspirational comments there and great ratings and reviews on whatever platform you're getting the show on, including Twitter. A lot of folks engage with our content via Twitter. Ad Options is our handle over there, of course, where you can learn more. And, of course, he also references my cohort, my compatriot in all things Options Bootcamp Crime, the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Mr. Dan, welcome back to the show. What do you think about more listener love for ye old OBC, sir? Yeah, that's really nice to get comments like that. I love love, Mark. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Theta Noob. We very, very much appreciate that. It's the fuel that keeps us going. You are quite addicted to the love. I think it's a bit of a problem. I do think you're going to counseling, though, so hopefully uh, that will get better in the new year as we keep on rolling with a little bit of the old basic training. All right, Moody! It's time to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Pull in. Print bear to learn. Yes, All right, everybody, welcome to the basic training segment, the portion of the show where we break down a basic options concept or technique or strategy and 
explain how you can utilize it in your own portfolio, maybe explore it in a little bit more depth here on the show. And Dan, I don't know if today's really qualifies as a basic training. It might be an options 201, even indeed a 301. It's certainly a concept that I know uh, terrifies a lot of people out there, which is why we've received so many questions about it, particularly recently. You know, it makes sense. Beginning of a new year, people are worried about a little bit of downside on ye old screen. We're coming off the tail end, pun intended, of a pretty strong upside year out there in the market. So people are looking at the downside and they're wondering and they're asking us about this phenomenon known as tail risk. What is it? What can they do about it in their own portfolios? And I say this is a 201 or maybe a 301 because it involves a variety of different concepts. It's also highly subjective. If you just type tail risk into your browser of choice, you're going to see a lot of different people defining it a lot of different ways. I know over the years on our network, people have come on and discussed the concept of tail risk in very different ways with very different approaches to how to deal with them. We'll get to some of those in a little bit. So this is an interesting term, a scary one for a lot of people, also a highly subjective one. So Dan... If I just throw it out to you, if I say tail risk, one of those word association type games, uh, what leaps to mind for you? What do you think of when I say tail risk? Well, for me, Mark, I think of the idea that um, the number of like very rare events, like six sigma events, occurs more often than a typical log normal distribution says they should. And so there's like this extra risk of rare events happening. That's what I think of. Yeah, it's very textbook of you, sir. Yes, uh, as Dan mentioned, we're going to try to uh, not give you a full crash course in stats here on the show. You can go look up things like normal distribution and all that kind of fun stuff on your own time. It is only a half hour show at the end of the day, roughly listens. But at the end of the day, Dan is correct. When you're talking about the prices for a lot of the assets that you folks typically trade in your portfolios, uh, they are typically normally distributed. What does that mean? That means you're looking at the old bell curve everyone is familiar with. And, uh, you know, that large hump in the middle there is going to be where your asset is currently trading right now. And as Dan mentioned, those multiple sigma, those multiple standard deviations away from uh, that is what we're really talking about here at the end of the day when we're talking about quote-unquote tail risk. The tails, of course, of that graph being the far outward sections and being pretty far away from the average from the mean there. And that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about tail risk. Multiple standard deviation moves. How many standard deviations? Again, that's where it starts to get subjective. Some people will say as, as little as two is a quote-unquote tail risk event. I think most people tend to line up around three or more standard deviation moves away from that mean is where you're really starting to talk about your tail risk, your quote unquote black swan type events out there, big moves. And because we're talking about assets that most people are long, they're usually focused on the left side of that graph, <laughs> the downside from an asset perspective. But it is worth noting at the end of the day, when we're talking about tail risk, it, it works both ways. It's a knife with two blades. It cuts both ways at the end of the day. A big upside moves also effectively qualify as tail risk. So back in 2021, when we were talking about the old GameStop and meme stock Palooza, that was certainly a tail risk event, but to the upside. And we've seen the risks that are posed by that. It's not all print and money. If you're long a bunch of GameStop through all that, sure, it's great. But if you're overriding calls to the upside or you're short or anything else, that upside tail risk can come back to bite you pretty aggressively. At the end of the day, remember, tail risk cuts both ways. If most people view it to the downside, to that left tail. That's what they're really focused on. But it can work in both directions, which is, again, why we're talking about it here on the show today. So normally distributed returns and normally distributed pricing of your asset. Uh, you're looking at a multiple standard deviation move which qualifies as tail risk. For most people, it's going to be a three standard deviation move to the left side, to the downside of that graph, a.k.a. whenever the S really hits the fan in a particular asset that you own. That's what most people would really qualify and quantify as tail risk at the end of the day. It's the old Supreme Court definition of pornography, right? You can't really define it, but you know it when you see it. We can define it, but you also know tail risk when you see it out there. So think of some big explosive moments in the market that come to mind. March of 2020, for example, a big one. February of 2018, aka Valmageddon, the 2008 financial crisis. These are all left tail, 
risk events at the end of the day. So yes, uh, ball exploded, big moves to the downside, multiple standard deviations away from where we were at the time. So that's the boilerplate definition of Taylor risk, which is what we're pretty much going to work with here on the show. Dan, does, does that work for your purposes, sir? Yeah, I think I can uh, deal with it here, man. All right, so let's get into uh, this tail risk thing. Now you're worried about it. You're worried about this multiple standard deviation price drop in your case. Could be in the index, could be in the S&P. Uh, what do you do about it? Well, a lot of different ways to approach. A lot of people like to play with tail risk by playing in the quote-unquote tail options. You know, we talk all the time on this show about the wings, the put wings and the call wings. Those are obviously extend above and below. The at the money puts below calls above. And when you're talking about tail risk, you're not really talking about at the money or even near out of the money. You're talking pretty far out of the money options, you know, five delta, 10 delta, somewhere in that range, maybe even below, depending on your viewpoint. That's where a lot of people view the, the tail risk component of your portfolio uh, coming into play. And we'll get to those in a little bit as well, the quote unquote garbage options out there. But Dan, when we're talking about tail risk, somebody comes to MTM and they say, you know, Mr. P, Professor AP, I am concerned about this quote unquote tail risk. What can I do about it, sir? What, what do you typically counsel them? What's your approach? <clears throat> well, um, I, I mean, I, I start steering the conversation towards, are you concerned about it as a trader or an investor? You know, um, if it's an investor, we could look at some things like, like collars, uh, you know, you're really only concerned with the downside tail as an investor, I think. Um, but as a trader, the thing that I like to tell people is let's focus on structuring positions where you have finite risk. Um, instead of selling naked puts, maybe we can sell some put spreads. So, you know, you can only lose so much. Um, you know, that, that's sort of the, the, the guts of, any of those conversations I'd be having. Yeah, a lot of different ways to uh, carve up this onion at the end of this day. Let's walk through a couple of them here. Dan mentioned some of them here. You know, the catch-all way people like to hedge away the tail risk in their portfolios is they come in and they go straight for the jugular. They're going to buy puts. In this particular case, they're going to buy maybe very meaty puts at the money, very near out of the money puts, 2%, 3% out of the money puts out there because they want to protect themselves against a worst case scenario. Maybe they're long a lot of, let's say the Qs, 50% upside last year. They don't want to give all that away. So uh, they're going to hedge it very tightly. Uh, we've talked about buying puts in the indexes or in a lot of broad equities many times on the decade plus <laughs> of years worth of shows here for options boot camps. You can go back into our archives and check out hedging with puts and all the pros and cons that go along with that. But you buy an at the money put near out of the money put, in any major index or any major equity, you know the downsides by now. It's going to be prohibitively expensive. The plus side pro is that you're going to hedge yourself against all this stuff. Market falls out of bed, your individual equity, whatever it is you're trading, falls out of bed. You're near out of the money or at the money put. It's going to cover you very nicely. It's going to be a nice warm blanket you could tuck in at night when everyone else is screaming and running for the exits out there. So that's one way people can approach it again extremely expensive and not a way we would recommend. Uh, you're going to give up a lot of your returns just over time if you try to maintain that hedge, rolling it month after month or quarter after quarter out there. Now, you can mitigate that. You can go a little bit farther out. And again, we're focusing mostly on the downside here because that's the tail risk most people are concerned about. We're not going to talk about buying far out of the money calls to hedge against a return of the 2021 meme stock Belusa, but if you are so inclined you could apply some of these approaches there as well gonna be a little bit cheaper to the upside in most equities so that's a bonus for looking to hedge tail risk to the upside but that's a conversation for another day let's go a little bit farther out of the money now and again farther out of the money puts the pros and cons of those we've also talked about these at length over the decade plus of this show they should be fairly common to most of our listeners by now again the pro they're going to be cheaper than your at the money or near out of the money put. But the downside is they're not going to protect you as much. But in this scenario, if you're all you're worried about is tail risk, you're worried about that multiple standard deviation move to the downside, farther out of the money put is going to serve you fairly well in that scenario out there. It's going to 
not stop you out against everything, but once the sell-off really starts kicking in, those puts are going to kick in as well. So as long as you don't get a slow decline, <laughs> that's a different conversation. But you get that aggressive, sharp sell-off, then those puts are going to work fairly well in terms of cutting off those extreme tails that everyone is worried about. And then we go a little bit farther out. And Dan, this is one I want to get your viewpoint on as well. Uh, because when you talk about farther out of the money puts, I was talking earlier in the show about tail options. Most people will look at the very far out of the money puts as, you know, effectively tail options, tail risk hedging type options, very small delta, two, three, five delta options. We sometimes back in the day on the trading floor would call these, you know, bullets. You'd buy these to have some bullets in the gun in case the big downside day does happen. You have some bullets to fire off at the end of the day. Good to have those in your back pocket for a rainy day. I've been talking about these a lot with our buddy Matt from Orats over the last year, year and a half. Uh, he's really kind of trying to lure me back to the dark side of these in an interesting way. Uh, we kind of jokingly, or maybe only half jokingly, refer to them, Dan, as garbage options, garbage calls, and garbage puts. He's been doing them in the calls, too, and things like VIX. And uh, playing around and also backtesting these very far out of the money, very low delta options. And what he's found, and something I've been kind of eyeballing myself as well, is that you don't need the multiple standard deviation move for those types of options to really pay off fairly well. 2x, 3x, maybe even more. Once you start really selling off, you have that skew effect starts kicking in, that volatility effect starts kicking in. Outside of any delta, it's not a delta move on these puts. They have very little to negligible delta. It's all volatility. It's all skew that kicks in. And it can kick in fairly aggressively. And you could actually end up doing fairly well without having an, a sizable sell-off. So these quote-unquote garbage puts and garbage calls in products like VIX are something that people are starting to take a second look at as maybe more of a fun speculative vehicle in 2023 and 2024. So I want to kind of just open the eyes of our listeners to them. They're not just for tail risk scenarios anymore. Not your mother's tail risk options anymore. They're useful in more scenarios than that. And people are starting to awaken to that. Dan, what are your thoughts on the whole notion of putting some of these garbage options, your garbage puts, your garbage calls in your back pocket for a rainy day. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be a thunderstorm. It doesn't even have to be a hurricane. It could be a light drizzle. And those puts could end up uh, maybe, maybe paying off in your back pocket, sir. Um, you know, I, I think you still need to pick your spots. Um, I mean, for me, when, when I buy puts and there are some times when I buy puts, uh, to protect against a down, downward move, I tend to like to buy more quality puts. Um, you can make a case for buying the, you know, so-called garbage ones that are just really far out there, sort of, um, reverse lottery tickets. Well, I don't know exactly how you would say that, but you know, just the way far out of the money and you'd be okay losing with them. But when the big massive move happens, they protect you, but I think you just lose so often on them. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think you still need to pick your spots either way when you're buying puts to protect against that tail risk. Oh, this is definitely a pick your spot type of trade. This is not a set it and forget it trade. You have to be on it. You have to find those moments when these puts are ticking up and get the heck out of Dodge when you can, uh, Mr. Dan. So again, not for the faint of heart, not for someone who wants to set it and forget it, but an intriguing idea, maybe one we should revisit down the road here on the show, Dan. Maybe we'll bring our buddy Matt back on because I know he's probably the biggest proponent of this trade that I know out there, and he's got some data to back it up, so it might be worth – I know you're a little gun shy. You're still a little sore from the great covered call debate, Mr. <laughs> Dan, but you know, if we can, if we can put bygones aside here on the show – Oh, we can bring Matt back on. That could be an interesting conversation to have because it is more intriguing when you start looking at it from a, an overall return perspective than you might initially assume. But again, not for the faint of heart, not for certainly the options 101 type trader out there, but something to keep in mind. Maybe we shall return to that. Let us know if you're intrigued by that, listeners, the concept of uh, some strategy, some effective ways to trade potentially these quote unquote garbage options, including very, very small delta puts in the S&P and small delta calls in VIX. All right, let's get to another way people approach a tail risk. And again, I said at the top of the show, this is a highly subjective topic and people are going to approach it in many different ways. Uh, there really is no one right answer to how to deal with tail risk or even what people term at tail risk at the end of the day. Uh, but there's many different approaches to them. One of the ones I think is the most intriguing 
is the old ratio spread. Let's walk through some examples. Remember I said earlier, you're going to buy, you're at the money put, or you're near out of the money put. We all know the downsides of that. What if you turn it on its head? What if you, instead of buying that near out of the money put, you sell it? Now things get a little crazy. Well, let's walk through some examples. Let's go out to everyone's favorite, XYZ, trading 100 bucks. Maybe you own 100 shares of it. You're sitting on some XYZ. Maybe it's up a bit, and you don't want to give that up. Or maybe you're worried about just a catastrophic downturn in this. Or maybe you're specking. Maybe you just want to spec on a catastrophic downturn. But you look out there at the options chain, and you see the one-month 95 strike put, so five handles, 5% out of the money. Very straightforward math on this one. Don't confuse anyone out there. It costs a dollar, our example, to go out one month to hedge this this stock or trade against this stock, spec on the downside of the stock for one month. Obviously, pricey, 1%. Uh, if you annualize that, assuming everything else is held equal, you know, that the price doesn't change, the skew doesn't change, the bottle doesn't change. You're talking somewhere around 12% annually for these puts if you roll them every month. That's a big outlay. You need a lot of upside. You need a 50 plus percent year in the NASDAQ like last year to really overcome that. So what can you do? to have some downside protection against quote-unquote tail risk without having this incredible drag on your portfolio. Well, one way some people go about that is by turning that on his head. They sell that one month 95 strike put and they collect a dollar. You might say, wait a minute, selling a put? What does that do to hedge tail risk? You're just getting more risk to the downside. And you are correct. But they turn around and use that premium now to buy more farther out of the money puts. So they're going to trade a ratio short put spread at the end of the day. Selling, in this case, the closer to the money put, buying two or more farther out of the money puts against it. Now, in our example, we're selling the one month 95 strike put for $1. Let's say in our example, the 90 strike put is trading 50 cents, a nice basic math. You can turn around and buy two of those now for the $1 you just collected for selling that 95 strike put. So now, what's happened? Well, that $1 outlay, it's gone. So that's a nice pro. You're flat now for the year, so if you maintain this approach throughout the year, all other things being held equal, you're not going to have that roughly 12% drag on your portfolio anymore. So that's a bonus. You're 12% to the upside. That's nice. <laughs> the downside is, of course, you can see you're selling a nearer to the money put. So if you get a modest little sell-off there, or you know, during the time you're doing this and rolling this trade, if XYZ closes between 95 and 90, you're going to be wearing it a little bit on this trade. That's something you have to be prepared for. There is some potential for near-term loss in this trade. Now, the flip side is if you're worried about that explosive downside move, that multiple standard deviation, that quote-unquote Six Sigma event <laughs> to the downside there, then this trade will pay off handsomely in that scenario. Your short one is obviously going to lose money, but your long two against it and that's where the or maybe more depending on the ratio you choose and now you have this explosive downside that's going to as we talked about that skew kicks in on these aggressive downside moves and the options that you are long are going to explode in a very aggressive manner compared to the one that you are short so for that extreme explosive tail risk move this is one way to maintain your skin in the game your seat at the table without costing you an arm and a leg so you can be there to capture that multiple standard deviation, a.k.a. that tail risk event. Dan, what are your thoughts on this approach, the ratio put spread approach to try to hedge your tail risk, sir, or spec on it? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, like a tail risk move is by definition just like a really profound move. And when you're, you know, when you're buying – a put to protect that tail risk, but then selling two more further out. I no, would no, no. argue the, you're o maybe... the other way around selling the narrow dated one and buying too farther out of the money. Oh, 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 okay. I got you. I got you. I got you. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it, that can, that can make sense, you know? Um, I mean, especially if you do it in such a way where you can roll the short one a couple of times in the situation. Well, see, this is where it gets tricky in the situation where you can actually have. Where if you roll the short one a couple of times, you can take in more premium than you originally paid. Or at least pretty much offset that. I think it can be OK, but. 
Mm, I don't know. I, I, I think that that's one that's pretty situational. And, and I think that sometimes you would find that it makes a lot of sense. And sometimes maybe it doesn't. Again, not an options 101 type approach, more of a, a 201 or maybe a 301. You hear a lot of people out there who are always, you know, espousing these black swan type events like the guy who coined it uh, to leave uh, out there, at least made it famous out uh, there. He, he's a fan of this type of ratio put spread approach. So there are different ways to do it. At the end of the day, I said this is highly subjective. Just look at Dan and I talking here. We don't agree on everything here for the tail risk and how to approach it because, again, it's a highly subjective thing. Dan, my, my favorite example of tail risk and how to deal with it came a few years ago on our network. We had a fund manager on, and he was talking about his new tail risk fund, Dan. And oh. his tail risk fund consisted of not puts or out-of-the-money puts or any of these things you would assume – with ratio puts, any of these things we talked about here in the S&P. No, his <coughs> fund was somewhere, I, I'm going to say 95 plus percent cash. And then the rest of the money was in out of the money SPX call options. <laughs> that was it. That was his tail risk fund. And uh, I kind of just thought, well, okay, that's, that's an approach. You can, if you can sell someone on that idea that that is your quote unquote tail risk fund, then at the end of the day, you know, hey, I, I suppose... To each their own out there, sir. So, you know, but hey, the tail risk, Dan, is highly subjective at the end of the day, which is one of the things we want to get across to you here on this show. Uh, let us know if you're intrigued by that idea of talking about uh, some garbage. Maybe we'll have another, another great debate, Dan versus Matt, this time on the pros and cons of trading garbage options. Let us know, listeners, if that sounds intriguing to you. All right, Mr. Dan, that music means we've got to get out of here. Luckily for all of our pro listeners, we got another episode coming right on the heels of this one. If you're like many listeners, listen after the fact, then of course you got to wait until next week to get episode two of this Options Bootcamp Palooza. Blame Mr. Dan. He's always a traveling man out there these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mr. Dan, any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners with when it comes to the ever subjective notion of tail risk? And then B, if folks want to come maybe debate tail risk or anything else with you, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, yeah, you know, ooh, getting a crazy echo over here. Holy moly. Um, so... Yeah. Interesting conversation. I'd love to pick it up. Uh, and anybody who wants to talk about that on more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, you're always welcome to hit me up at markettaker.com and, um, you know, join our chat room, which is free right now. Message me in there and I'd love to chat, help out any way I can. There you go. Check him out. Markettaker.com, the place to go to learn more we have to get on out of here back again instantaneously for all of our pro folks for the second episode of our options boot camp double header listeners and then of course back again next week for all you on demand folks another episode of options boot camp stay safe out there everybody you're listening to the options insider radio network the home of the options podcast for more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs>